Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is the 1965 Cleveland Indians ALMLB baseball season. The other tribe was playing in the American League, the junior circuit of Major League Baseball, and home games were played at Cleveland Municipal Stadium downtown, where First Energy Stadium now stands. The tribe had a strong year in 1965. They finished in fifth place with a record of 87 and 75. 12 games over 500, winning percentage of 537, 15 games out of first. The first place team was the Minnesota Twins, who were 102 and 60, winning percentage of 630. This was really something. This was the only the fifth year of the Minnesota Twins after moving from uh, Washington at, when they were the Senators, and now they were. They won the American League pennant. Second place, the Chicago White Sox, who were 95 and 67, seven games out of first. Third place, the Baltimore Orioles, 94 and 68. Fourth place, the, De- the Detroit Tigers, 89 and 73. Fifth place, the Cleveland Indians, 87 and 75. Sixth place, the New York Yankees, 77 and 80, 85. 25 games out of first. Seventh place, the California Angels, 75 and 87. Eighth place, the Washington Senators, 70 and 92. Ninth place, the Boston Red Sox, 62 and 100. And in tenth and last place, the Kansas City Athletics, 59 and 103, winning a percentage of 364, 43 games out of first. Just imagine the Tribe finished ahead of the Yankees in 1965. Tribe attendance. In 1965, at home was 934,786 for an average of 11,541 per game. That was up 280,000 from 1964. January 20th, 1965 was the big trade. Tommy John, Tommy Adji, and John Romano were traded for Rocky Calavito. So, Rocky Calavito was back. It was really something. Try was in first place from June 28th to July 5th. And they had a 10-game winning streak from June 13th to June 22nd. 1965 was the start of the MLB Amateur Draft. And the Tribe's first selection in in that draft was Ray Fossey. He became a fine catcher. Now, Mets general manager Casey Stengel was 75 years old, and he fell during the season, had a broken hip, and retired at the end of the season. And the Mets retired his number 37. So it was the end of an era. September 12th at the Astrodome in Houston, which was called the 8th Wonder of the World, Willie Mays hit his 500th career home run. I read, I read a fine book. The title is Sad Riddance, the Milwaukee Braves 1965 Season Amid a Sport and a World in Turmoil by Chuck Hildebrand, 2016. The Milwaukee Braves had been uh, or the Braves had been in Milwaukee from 1953 to 1965, but then uh, this was their last year, and in 1966 they would be the Atlanta Braves. Now the uh, challenges that, that they had is the uh, uh, Minnesota Twins had moved into Minneapolis, and there were the two Chicago teams, so Milwaukee had a limited market, and Atlanta had a huge market, the entire southeast 1965 was a tumultuous year. There was the escalation of the war in Vietnam, the Watts riots in Los Angeles, and the passage of the Voting Rights Act, also the assassination of Malcolm X. The New York Yankees finished in the second division. What they used to call this when there were no divisions. It used to be that when it was the eight-team American League, that would be top four would be the first division, and the and bottom four of the second. Now, now there, there was the 10-team league with no divisions, but uh, so-called. Uh, anyway, they were in the second division the, for the first time in 40 years. Mets minority owner was, uh, one of them was M. Donald Grant, and they had, one day they had banner day at Shea Stadium where fans could bring banners, and one of them was Welcome to Grant's Tomb, <laughs> and uh, referring to Make a play on words, the tomb of Ulysses S. Grant in, in New York. The banner was confiscated by security guards and sliced to pieces. And they were charged with, the, uh, the, the charge was, it, it was an ins- considered an insult to ownership. 1965, the Beatles performed at Shea Stadium, the first rock concert in, in an outdoor stadium. 
In August, the Watts riots in Los Angeles took place. 46 square miles of south-central Los Angeles was a war zone, or became a war zone. There were 15,000 National Troops National Guard troops called to restore order. 34 dead, 1,000 injured, 4,000 people arrested, and $40 million in property destroyed. Now, after the big trade for Rocky Calavito, Cleveland sports writer Russell Schneider wrote, quote, Tribe fans weren't exactly dancing in the streets. There was too much snow in Cleveland that day. But don't bet the fans wouldn't have done just that had the weather been better. The Tribe had a profit in 1965. They made $600,000. Jack Torrey wrote, quote, The years of cutting the, ti- the team's farm system had taken their toll. There was no longer a quick fix for the Indians. Even Rocky Calavito could not save them. Gabe Paul was back as the, tri- as the uh, tribe head of the ownership group and general manager. And Paul was the head of the tribe ownership group from 1963 to 1965. He was the tribe general manager from 1961 to 1973. And from 1978 to 1984, he owned 11% of the team. 1965, Gabe Paul was offered the job of commissioner of baseball, but he turned it down. His daughter, Jenny Paul, wrote, quote, For Dad, loyalty was more important than money. His goal was to keep the Indians in Cleveland with enough capital to build a winning ball club that could meet payroll without having to trade away star players like Jim Mudcat Grant. Listening was something Gabe Paul did all, did all his baseball life. It was his strength. Dad knew more about the business of baseball than anyone in the game. Gabe Paul. Now, Jimmy Dudley was back on WERE Radio, and Dudley was a tribe radio broadcaster from 1948 to 1967. Jimmy Dudley. His partner was Bob Neal on WERE Radio. Bob Neal was a tribe TV and radio broadcaster from 1952 to 1953, and from 1957 to 1972, Bob Neal. Harry Jones was on broadcasting tribe games on WJW-TV. Harry Jones was a tribe radio broadcaster from 1961 to 1963, a tribe TV broadcaster from 1964 to 1974 and in 1977. He was a Cleveland Plain Dealer reporter from 1940 to 1947 and a Cleveland Plain Dealer sports writer from 1947 to 1960, Harry Jones. His partner on television was Herb Score who was a Tribe player from 1955 to 1959. Score was a Tribe TV and radio broadcaster from 1964 to 1997. And he's buried in Lakewood Park Cemetery in Rocky River, Ohio. Herb Score. Bertie Tebbets was back as Tribe manager. Tebbets was a Tribe player from 1951 to 1952 and Tribe manager from 1963 to 1966. Tebbets wrote, quote, I loved Hank Greenberg. He was a gentleman in every sense of the word from the time I came into the big leagues. I don't know whether anybody has caught as many great pitchers as I did over a whole career. The first time I met Gabe Paul, it became a friendship that lasted for the next 40 years. Gabe and I, while we had our differences, really liked each other deep down and got on just fine. Gabe Paul is as good a man as you'd ever want. One thing I couldn't tolerate was complaining about the weather. I'd fine anybody $25 for complaining that it was too hot or too cold or raining. I wanted my ball players to come on the field wanting to play. The most important attribute of a manager is to instill confidence in his players, even when they're doing badly. When a player's confidence is, is gone, you don't have a ball player. Ted Williams said, quote, Bertie Tebbets was one of the greatest guys I ever met. Bertie Tebbets wrote, quote, We don't spend enough time counseling the wives in baseball. A player has a life outside of baseball, a wife and kids, and all the rest. We have to pay more attention to that. The family life of everybody is terribly important. The baseball player's life is great for the men, but it's tough on the women, and even tougher on the kids. A ball player packs his bag and says so long to the lady, tells her to look after the kids, and he's gone. And the next thing he knows, the kids are in school and graduating. And where has he been? Bertie Tebbets. Sally, Te- Sally Hemis was back, uh, and Sam- Hemis was a tribe coach from 1964 to 1965. This was the end of his time in Cleveland. He continued in Major League Baseball as a, as a manager in the minors for the Mets in 1966. Sally Hemis. 
George Strickland was back. Strickland was a track player from 1952 to 1957 and from 1959 to 1960. He was a tribe coach from 1963 to 1969 and tribe interim manager for parts of the 1964 and 1966 seasons, George Strickland. Early Wynn was back. Wynn was a tribe player from 1949 to 1957 and in 1963, and he was a tribe coach from 1964 to 1966, Early Wynn. Now the starting lineup, Joe Askew was the catcher. Askew batted 230 with 77 hits. He scored 16 runs, 7 doubles, 2 home runs, 35 RBIs, 2 stolen bases, 27 walks in 111 games. And Askew was with Cleveland from 1963 to 1969. Joe the Immortal Cuban, Askew. Fred Whitfield was at first base. Whitfield batted 293 with 137 hits. He scored 49 runs, 23 doubles, a triple, 26 home runs, 90 RBIs, two stolen bases, 16 walks, and 132 games. And Whitfield was with Cleveland from 1963 to 1967. Fred Whitfield. Pedro Gonzalez was at second base. Gonzalez batted 253 with 101 hits. He scored 38 runs, 14 doubles, 3 triples, 5 home runs, 39 RBIs, 7 stolen bases, 18 walks, and 116 games. Gonzalez was born in 1937 in San Pedro de Macariz, Dominican Republic, and he's 81 years old in 2019. For his career, he batted 244 with 8 home runs and 70 RBIs. He played for the New York Yankees and Cleveland Indians from 1963 to 1967. He was traded to the Tribe on May 10, 1965, by the Yankees for first baseman Ray Barker. Also in, in his career, he worked as a scout for the Atlanta Braves. Pedro Gonzalez. Larry Brown was at shortstop. Brown batted 253 with 111 hits. He scored 52 runs, 22 doubles, 2 triples, 8 home runs, 40 RBIs, 5 stolen bases, 38 walks, and 124 games. And Brown was with Cleveland from 1963 to 1971. And he won the 1965 Gordon Cobbledick Golden Tomahawk Award. Larry Brown. Max Alvis was at third base. Alvis batted 247 with 149 hits. He scored 88 runs, 24 doubles, 2 triples, 21 home runs, 61 RBIs, 12 stolen bases, 47 walks, 121 strikeouts, and 159 games. And Alvis was with Cleveland from 1962 to 1969, and he played on the 1965 American League All-Star team. Max Alvis. Leon Wagner was in left field. Wagner batted 294 with 152 hits. He scored 91 runs, 18 doubles, a triple, 28 home runs, 79 RBIs, 12 stolen bases, 60 walks, and 144 games. And Wagner was with Cleveland from 1964 to 1968. Leon Daddy Wags Wagner. Vic Davalio was in center field. Davalio batted 301 with 152 hits. He scored 67 runs, 19 doubles, a triple, 5 home runs, 40 RBIs, 26 stolen bases. 35 walks in 142 games, and Davalio was with Cleveland from 1963 to 1968. He played on the 1965 American League All-Star team, and he was third in the American League in batting, and he was tied for fourth in stolen bases. Vic Davalio. Rocky Calavito was in right field. Calavito batted 287 with 170 hits. He scored 92 runs, 25 doubles, 2 triples, 26 home runs. 108 RBIs, a stolen base, 93 walks, and 162 games. Calavito was a tribe player from 1955 to 1959 and from 1965 to 1967. He was a tribe coach in 1973 and from 1976 to 1978 and a tribe TV broadcaster in 1972 and from 75 to 76. He led the American League in RBIs in 65. He was fifth in the American League in the MVP voting. Calabito played on the 1965 American League All-Star team, and he was the 1965 Tribe Man of the Year. He tied an MLB record by playing in 162 se- games the entire season with, without an error. Doug Kirkle wrote, quote, Rocky Calavito attended a, a high school named for Teddy Roosevelt, who was known for his philosophy to speak softly and carry a big stick. The mantra applied perfectly to Calavito's career in baseball. One fan wrote, quote, Rocky Calavito had all the qualities of a hero in Cleveland. 
He was Italian, good-looking with dark hair, friendly eyes and a big smile, and he could, he could hit the ball a New York mile. Rocky was to Cleveland what Mickey Mantle was to New York. There's a, there is a petition for Rocky Calavito to be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. And online, it's RockyCalavitoFans.com. After the 1965 trade, which returned uh, Calavito to the tribe, he said, quote, I never wanted to leave Cleveland. I've never looked forward to a season more than this one. Max Alvis said, quote, Rocky was such a gracious person. He hustled all the time. The guys on the team loved him. He brought so much class to our team, and it was a real emotional thing for him to come back. Terry Pluto wrote, quote, What it came down to was this. Rocky Calavito's return made baseball fun again. Vern Fuller said, quote, The great thing about Rocky was that while he was a star, he pulled for everyone on the team, even the 25th man. He was really sincere. Everybody on the team looked up to him. I'm reading a fine book. The title is Rocky Calavito, Cleveland's Iconic Slugger by Mark Summer, 2019. Mark Summer wrote, quote, Rocky Calavito remains one of Cleveland's most beloved sports stars. After several hundred hours of interviews, I found Rocky Calavito to be, the, to be the admirable and upright person fans have believed him to be. He is humble, down to earth, grateful to his supporters, and fiercely loyal to Cleveland. Regarding the 1960 trade of Calavito, Gary Stromberg said, quote, For all of the ten-year-olds, we were burdened forever with the horror of losing Rocky that terrible day. Mark Sommer wrote, quote, it's impossible to overestimate how important Calavito was to Italian Americans in Cleveland and throughout Northeast Ohio. Basil Russo said, quote, Rocky Calavito created a favorable image for Italians throughout the country. Calavito practiced his Calavito had the practice throughout his career of of uh, throughout his career of running quickly from the dugout to right field and back and to his to, and it, for, during every half inning, going out, playing defense, and coming back. You're running, running fast, coming in and out. And he, he did this to keep himself in shape, and it was adopted by his teammate, Roger Maris. Maris said, quote, Hey, Rocco Sacco, I always run out to my position, and I run in, and I haven't had any problems with my legs. Regarding his roommate and friend, Herb Score, uh, Calavita said, quote, about Herb Score, We just kind of got thrown together, and then we became really close. He respected me, and I respected him. We were inseparable. He was more like a brother than a friend. I went to church regularly. I think it, it helped, it's helped me pull through some tough times. I used to pray a lot. I looked to God for help, and I got it at a lot of times. Herb Score was my best friend all time. We always kept in touch with each other. Mark Sommer wrote, quote, Rocky Calavito throughout his career signed autographs after games until every kid in line received one. As a youth, Calavito had been turned down by Yankee players. He grew up in New York trying to get autographs. Calavito said, quote, I said to myself that if I ever get to the big leagues, I'm going to sign them. Regarding, regarding Little Italy in Cleveland, Calavito said, quote, Little Italy was one of those places frozen in time. I was very, very proud to be Italian. 19, 1950, 1956, Mark Sommer wrote, quote, Cleveland fans took a shine to their emerging right fielder. They liked his unbridled enthusiasm, his hustle, and the appreciation and respect he showed them. The home run hitting outfielder with a cannon for an arm had quickly become a crowd favorite. Rocky Calavito said, quote, Hank Greenberg was a prince. When Hank gave his word, it was as good as gold. Ted Williams in 1957 regarding Rocky Calavito said, quote, I can't think of any player who is striving more to improve. Regarding the 1960 trade of Calavito, Gary Bell said, quote, It was like a knife in the heart when they traded him. After the 1960 trade, Calavito said, quote, I was in a state of shock. I was really shook up. The trade made me feel like a failure. From 1958 to 1962, if the five-year period, Calavito hit 200 home runs for an average of 40 a year. And that was most in MLB, better than Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays, Henry Aaron, and the other sluggers of the era. Willie Horton was a Tigers teammate, and he said, quote, Rocky Calavito is a quality human being, an Abraham Lincoln-type person because of the way he was concerned about equal living for everybody. 
He always wanted to help people. He was a good person, a people-type person. Calavito was traded in 1964 by Detroit to the Kansas City Athletics, and Charlie Finley was the owner who has had a number of innovations. At, at home plate, there was a compressed air device installed below the ground that blew the dirt off the plate so the umpire didn't have to sweep it off with his little br- little broom. There, and also, a, a Finley in Kansas City had a mechanical rabbit pop out of the ground to hand new baseballs to the umpire. Uh, he had a team mascot, a, a mule named Charlie O. Finley proposed orange baseballs. He also proposed de- the designated hitter, interleague play, and night games for the World Series, all things which were adopted. In 1964, Calavito hit his 300th career home run. He was the fifth fastest to reach 300 and 24th ML- MLB player to hit 300 home runs. On January 20th, 1965, he was treated back to the tribe. He said, quote, I'm glad to be home in Cleveland, and I do mean home. Every year when I went into Cleveland with the Tigers and Athletics, I'd say to myself, wouldn't it be nice to be playing here again? Mark Summer wrote, quote, The news of Calavito's return triggered a flood of emotions from Indians fans who couldn't wait to see him wearing the team uniform in Cleveland Municipal Stadium. Gabe Paul said, quote, We needed Rocky Calavito to save the franchise. On opening day, Calavito hit a home run, and the report in the newspaper was, quote, Rocky's two-run homer in the sixth inning shook the ballpark like it hasn't been shaken in years. Bob Sudik said, quote, The magic Rocky projects in Cleveland is as strong as ever, despite his five-year exile to Detroit and Kansas City. Seldom has a professional athlete and a city wanted and needed each other so much. On June 18th at the stadium, Calavito had a tape measure home run into the upper deck. The plane dealer reported, quote, Rocky Calavito, Calavito unloaded one of the mightiest home runs ever hit at Cleveland Municipal Stadium. Calavito said, quote, I never hit a ball harder. Red Sox slugger Tony Canigliaro said, quote, He's the greatest guy I ever met. I went and asked Calavito if he could or would help me. He spent more than an hour with me regarding batting advice. A, a, a Cleveland newspaper columnist wrote, quote, It is pure, undying, and unbelievable. The romance between Cleveland and Rocky Calavito. Rocky Calavito. The bench players included Chuck Hinton, who was a utility player. Hinton batted 255 with 110 hits. He scored 59 runs, 17 doubles, 6 triples, 18 home runs, 54 RBIs, 17 stolen bases, 53 walks in 133 games. Hinton was born in 1934 in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, and died in 2013 in Washington, D.C. at age 78. For his career, he batted 264 with 113 home runs and 443 RBIs. Hinton played for the Washington Senators, Cleveland Indians, <coughs> California, California Angels, and back with the Tribe from 1961 to 1971. He was an all-star in 1964 with the Senators. Hinton went to Shaw University and played on the baseball, football, and basketball teams, the Shaw Bears. He spent two years in the U.S. Army in the minors. He had two batting league titles for the Aberdeen Pheasants in 1959 and the Stock, Stockton Ports in 1960. In 1962, in MLB, he was fourth in the American League in batting, hit 310 and second in stolen bases. He was traded to the tribe by the Senators for Woody Held and Bob Chance. From 1972 to 2000, Hinton was the head baseball coach at Howard University. In 1982, he founded the MLB Players Alumni Association to promote baseball, raise money for charity, and inspire and educate the youth and and project a positive sports image and protect the dignity of the game. Hinton died of Parkinson's disease. He's the last senator to hit 300. His number 32 is honored in the Washington Hall of Fame. I'm reading a fine book. The title is My Turn It Bad, A Story of Perseverance by Chuck Hinton, 2002. His oldest daughter, John Kill, died in 2002 at age 41, shortly before the book was published. Chuck Hinton wrote, quote, In baseball, you are competing against other teams, but you don't have to be unkind. Baseball was so much fun for me, and my love for the game and all that it stood for was the great thrill that I can't really put into words. I think that being an all-around nice person is, always, is also important to being successful. You can't be everyone's friend, but you can be nice to everyone. 
The physical part of baseball was easy. The mental part is what makes the difference. Talent will get you in the door, but mental toughness will keep you there. Life is about making adjustments. Doing the best you can is all you can do. He started in the minors on the bench, and he said, quote, There is a time to keep your mouth closed, your ears open, and learn whatever you can. It was a hard pill to swallow, but you do what you have to do. It is heartbreaking that my father passed away only one year before I made it to the pros. He was constantly on my mind. I am sure that my father was a large factor in my success. He really believed in me. Hinton was drafted and spent two years in the U.S. Army. Chuck Hinton. Dick Hauser batted. Dick Hauser played some shortstop. Hauser batted 235 with 72 hits. He scored 47 runs, eight doubles, two triples, a home run, six RBIs, 17 stolen bases, 47 walks in 107 games. And Hauser was with Cleveland from 1963 to 1965. Dick Hauser. Duke Sims was a spare catcher. Sims batted 178 with 21 hits. He scored nine runs, had six home runs, 15 RBIs, 15 walks in 48 games. And Sims was with Cleveland from 1964 to 1970. Duke Sims. Chico Salmon played some first base. He batted 242 with 29 hits. Salmon scored 20 runs, 8 doubles, 3 home runs, 12 RBIs, 7 stolen bases, 5 walks, and 79 games. And Salmon was with Cleveland from 1964 to 1968. Chico Salmon. Cam Carrion was another spare catcher. Carrion batted 231 with 12 hits. He scored six runs, two doubles, a triple, a home run, seven RBIs, a stolen base, nine walks in 19 games. Carrion was born in 1937 in Colton, California, and died in 1987 in Tucson, Arizona at age 50. For his career, he batted 264 with 11 home runs and 114 RBIs. Carrion played for the Chicago White Sox, Cleveland Indians, Baltimore Orioles from 1959 to 1966. He had service in the U.S. Army. The Miners, he played for the Colorado Springs Sky Sox, the Portland Beavers, and Tucson Toros, and for Venezuela, for Rapinos de Occidente. Carrion is, Carrion is one of five tribe players whose sons also played for the tribe. The others were Jim Bagby, a junior and se- senior, Earl Averill, Tito Francona, and Buddy Bell. And Carrion's son, Mark, played for the tribe in 1996. Cam Carrion. Phil Roof was another spare catcher. Roof batted 173 with nine hits. He scored three runs at a double, three RBIs, five walks, and 43 games. Roof was born in 1941 in Paducah, Kentucky, and he's 78 years old in 2019. For his career, he batted 215 with 43 home runs and 210 RBIs. Roof played for the Milwaukee Braves, Los Angeles Angels, Cleveland Indians, Kansas City Athletics, Oakland Athletics, Milwaukee Brewers, Minnesota Twins, Chicago White Sox, and Toronto Blue Jays from 1961 to 1977. He was a relatively weak hitter, but he had a lengthy career because of, he was valuable for his defensive abilities. He was the first player acquired by the expansion Toronto Blue Jays. His cousin Eddie Haas was an MLB player. 1964, Roof was arrested in a Houston nightclub with early win. Roof was a coach for the San Diego Padres in 1978 and the Seattle Mariners from 1983 to 88, the Chicago Cubs in 1990 to 91. He was a manager manager for 16 years in the minors in the Twins system and won 100 games in 2004, retired in 2005. I'm sorry, he won 1,000 games uh, managing the minors. He was a coach for the Twins in 2011. His brother Gene Roof was an MLB player. In the minors, Roof played for the Denver Bears, Iowa Oaks, Louisville Colonels, and Portland Beavers. Phil Roof. Al Luplo played some outfield. Luplo batted 133 with six hits and 45 at bats. He scored three runs, had two doubles, a home run, four RBIs, three walks, and 53 games. Luplo was with Cleveland from 1961 to 1965. This was the end of his time in Cleveland. His MLB career continued until 1967. And his his great nephew, Jordan Luplo, is a current tribe player in 2019. Al Luplo. Lou Clinton played some outfield. Clinton batted 176 with six hits. He scored two runs at a double, a home run, two RBIs, three walks, and 12 games. Clinton was born in 1937 in Ponca City, Oklahoma, and died in 1997 in Wichita, Kansas, at age 60. For his career, he batted 247 with 65 home runs and 269 RBIs. 
Clinton played for the Boston Red Sox, Los Angeles Angels, California Angels, Kansas City Athletics, Cleveland Indians, and New York Yankees from 1960 to 1967. 19, in 1960, in a game the Tribe Red Sox, Vic Power for the Tribe hit a ball that bounced off the right field wall, hit Clinton's foot, and then bounced over the fence for a home run. When Roger Maris hit his 61st home run in 1961, Clinton was playing right field for Boston. The ball was hit over his head into the stands. 1962, Clinton, Clinton hit for the cycle. After he retired, he worked in the oil business in Wichita, Kansas, and died of pneumonia. In the minors, he played for the San Diego Padres and Seattle Rainiers. Lou Clinton. Billy Moran was a middle infielder. Moran batted 125 with three hits and 24 at-bats. He scored a run at two walks in 22 games. Moran was with Cleveland from 1958 to 1959, and from 1964 to 1965, and this was the end of his MLB career. Billy Moran. Bill Davis was a pinch hitter. He was a first baseman. He batted 300 with three hits and 10 at-bats. Struck out once in 10 games. Davis was born in 1942 in Graceville, Minnesota, and he's 77 years old in 2019. For his career, he batted 181 with one home run and five RBIs. He played for the Cleveland Indians from 1965 to 1966 and the San Diego Padres in 1969. The entire 1967 season, he was on the disabled list because he had a ruptured Achilles tendon after, while playing basketball. He started the first ever National League uh, First ever National League MLB game in San Diego, the San Diego Padres, starting first baseman on April 8, 1969. After he retired, he worked in real estate and banking. He played for the University of Minnesota Golden Gophers baseball team. In the minors, Davis played for the Denver Bears, Tulsa Oilers, and Portland Beavers. Bill Davis. Ray Barker played some first base. Barker batted six times, did not have a hit, a hit walked twice, struck out twice in 11 games. Barker was born in 1936 in Martinsburg, West Virginia, and died in 2018 in Martinsburg at age 82. For his career, he batted 214 with 10 home runs and 44 RBIs. Barker played for the Baltimore Orioles in 1960, the Cleveland Indians, and New York Yankees from 65 to 67. They called him Buddy. In the minors, he never failed to reach double digits in home runs. In the minors, he played for the Columbus Foxes, Knoxville Smokies, Thetford Mines, Miners, Portland Beavers, and Vancouver Mounties. Ray Barker. George Banks played some third base. Banks batted 200 with one hit and five at-bats. He stole a base, had a walk, struck out three times in four games, and Banks was with Cleveland from 1964 to 1966. George Banks. Tony Martinez played some shortstop. Martinez batted three times, did not have a hit in four games, and Martinez was with Cleveland from 1963 to 1966. Tony Martinez. Richie Scheinbloom, Richie Scheinbloom batted once, did not have a hit, scored a run in four games. Scheinbloom was born in 1942 in New York, New York, and he's 76 years old in 2019. For his career, he batted 263 with 13 home runs and 127 RBIs. Scheinbloom played for the Cleveland Indians, Washington Senators, Kansas City Royals, Cincinnati Reds, California Angels, St. Louis Cardinals, and the Hiroshima Toyo Carp in Japan from 1965 to 1976. He was an All-Star in 1972 with the Royals, 1971 double A MVP, and hit a league league leading record 388. Scheinbloom was Jewish. He was born in Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan, New York City. He went to CW Post College and played on the baseball, basketball, and track teams. Scheinbloom was a switch hitter. The 1972 Munich, in Munich Olympics massacre, after that, he wore a black armband to honor the slain Israeli athletes. And he said, quote, I wore the emblematic bl black band, not only because they were Jewish athletes, but because they were human beings. He currently works as a salesman promoting in promotional the promotional products industry. His son, Monty Scheinbloom, 1992, won the U.S. National Long Driving Golf Championship. The miners Scheinbloom played for the Denver Bears, Tulsa Oilers, and Portland Beavers, and in Venezuela for Leones de Caracas, Richie Scheinbloom. Ralph Gagliano was a pinch runner. He did not bat in one game. He was born in 1946 in Memphis, Tennessee, and he's 72 years old in 2019. His MLB career was just uh, with Cleveland in 1965. His brother Phil Gagliano was an MLB player, and he had four years in the minors. Ralph Gagliano. 
The pitching staff was anchored by sudden Sam McDowell, who was 17-11 with a league-leading 2.18 ERA, 42 games, 35 starts, 14 complete games, 3 shutouts, 4 saves, 273 innings pitched, and a league-leading 325 strikeouts. Wow. McDowell batted 126 with 12 hits and 95 at-bats. He scored 5 runs, had a double, 4 RBIs, a walk, and struck out 35 times. McDowell was with Cleveland from 1961 to 1971. Again, he led the American League in strikeouts and ERA and played on the 1965 American League All-Star team. Sudden Sam McDowell. Louis Tiant was 11-11 with an ERA of 3.53. 41 games, 30 starts, 10 complete games, 2 shutouts, a save, 196 in a third innings pitched, and 152 strikeouts. Tiant batted 088. 088 with six hits and 68 at bats. He scored two runs, had a home run, three RBIs, three walks, and struck out 30 times. McDowell was with Cleveland from 1964 to 1969. Louis, Louis Tiant said, quote, All through life, you should be prepared for something new. Doctors do it, and I think baseball players are no, are no dif- different. After one good year, you just can't relax and tell yourself everything will be good from now on. Being good today does not mean you will also be good tomorrow. You've got to keep working at it. Being in the big leagues is not easy. Louis Tiant. Sonny Siebert was 16-8 and eight with an ERA of 2.43. 39 games, 29 starts, 4 complete games, a shutout, a save, 188 and two-thirds innings pitched, and 191 strikeouts. Siebert batted 106 with 7 hits and 66 at-bats. He scored two runs at a double a home run, four RBIs, and struck out 18 times. Siebert was with Cleveland from 1964 to 1969. What a fine year for Sonny Siebert. Ralph Terry was 11-6 with an ERA of 3.69. 30 games, 26 starts, 6 complete games, 2 shutouts, 165 and 2 thirds innings pitched, and 84 strikeouts. Terry batted 143 with 7 hits. He scored 2 runs, had 2 doubles, a home run, 4 RBIs, 4 walks, and struck out 21 times. Terry was born in 1936 in Big Cabin, Oklahoma, and he's 83 years old in 2019. For his career, he was 107-99 with an ERA of 3.62 and 1,000 strikeouts. Terry played for the New York Yankees, Kansas City Athletics, Cleveland Indians, and New York Mets from 1956 to 1967. He was a two-time American League All-Star in the two games in 1962. He won two World Series titles in 1961 and 62 with the Yankees. He was the World Series MVP in 1962 and the American League wins leader in 1962. 1960 World Series Game 7, he had the walk. He gave up the walk-off uh, World Series winning home run against Bill Mazeroski, and that must have been pretty tough. However, in 1962, he was on the mound at... at at the end of the World Series again, this time in a winning effort, Game 7, the last out, when Willie McCovey hit a line drive at, at Bobby that was caught by Bobby Richardson. After he retired, Terry was a pro golfer. He won the 1980 Midwest PGA Championship. He appears in Yankees old-timers games. He's also worked in the insurance business. And today, he golfs as a hobby. Ralph Terry. Jack Kralik was 5-11 with an ERA of 4.92, 30 games, 16 starts, a complete game, 86 innings pitched, and 34 strikeouts. Kralik batted 143 with three hits. He had two RBIs and struck out eight times. Kralik was with Cleveland from 1963 to 1967. Jack Kralik. Gary Bell was the closer in the bullpen. Bell was 6-5 with an ERA of 3.04. 60 games all out of the bullpen, 16 saves, 103 and two-thirds innings pitch, and 86 strikeouts. Bell batted 0-63 with one hit and 16 at-bats. He scored a run, had a home run in RBI, and struck out seven times. Bell was with Cleveland from 1958 to 1967. Carol Conklin wrote, quote, Gary Bell started out his career as a hard-throwing starter, relying on heat and guts while pitching for struggling Cleveland Indians teams. He gradually evolved into, into one of the American League's most effective, effective middle relievers with off-speed pitches that helped him get, get more out of less fastball. Gary Bell. Lee Stang was 8-4 and four with an ERA of 3.34, 41 games, 12 starts, 4 complete games, 2 shutouts, 132 innings pitched, and 80 strikeouts. Stang batted 107 with 3 hits. He scored 4 runs, had an RBI. Seven walks and struck out 12 times. Stang was with Cleveland from 1964 to 1966. Lee Stang. 
Don McMahon was a relief pitcher. McMahon was 3-3 with an ERA of 3.28. 58 games, 11 saves, 85 innings pitched, and 60 strikeouts. McMahon batted 222 with two hits and nine at-bats and struck out five times. McMahon was a Tribe player from 1964 to 1966 and a Tribe coach from 1983 to 1985. Don McMahon. Floyd Weaver was 2-2 two two with an ERA of 5.43, 32 games, one start, a save, 61 in a third innings pitched, and 37 strikeouts. Weaver batted 091 with one hit and 11 at-bats. He scored a run, had a double, a walk, and struck out eight times. Weaver was with Cleveland in 1962 and, 19, and in 1965. This was the end of his time in Cleveland. His MLB career continued until 1971. Floyd Weaver. Steve Hargan was 4-3 with an ERA of 3.43. 17 games, 8 starts, a complete game, 2 saves, 60, and a third innings pitched and 37 strikeouts. Hargan batted 0-53 with 1 hit and 19 at-bats. He scored a run and struck out 6 times. Hargan was born in 1942 in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and he's 76 years old in 2019. For his career, he was 87 and 107 with an ERA of 3.92 and 891 strikeouts. Hargan pitched for the Cleveland Indians, Texas Rangers, Toronto Blue Jays, and Atlanta Braves from 1965 to 1977. He was an all-star in 1967 with the Tribe. In 67, he led the American League in shutouts with six. In the minors, he played for the Columbus Clippers, Dubuque Packers, Wichita Arrows, Toledo Mud Hens, Selma Cl- and Selma Cloverleafs, and in Venezuela for Leones de Caracas, Steve Hargan. Tom Kelly was 2-1 with an ERA of 2.40, four games, all starts, a complete game, 30 innings pitched, and 31 strikeouts. Kelly batted 222 with two hits and nine at-bats. He scored a run and an RBI a walk and struck out six times. Kelly was with Cleveland from 1964 to 1967. Tom Kelly. Dick Donovan was 1-3 with an ERA of 5.96, 12 games, 3 starts, 22 and 2 thirds innings pitched, and 12 strikeouts. Donovan batted 6 times and struck out, did not have a hit, struck out 4 times. Donovan was with Cleveland from 1962 to 1965, and this was the end of his MLB career. Dick Donovan. Bobby Tiefenauer was 0-5 with an ERA of 4.84, 15 games, 4 saves, 22 and a third innings pitched, and 13 strikeouts. He batted once, did not have a hit, and struck out. Tiefenauer was with Cleveland in 1960, 1965, and in 1967. Bobby Tiefenauer. Jack Spring was 1-2 with an ERA of 3.74, 14 games, 21 and two-thirds innings pitched, and 9 strikeouts. He batted 333 with one hit and three at-bats and struck out once. Spring was born in 1933 in Spokane, Washington, and died in 2015 in Spokane at age 82. For his career, he was 12-5 and with an ERA of 4.26 and 86 strikeouts and 186 innings pitched. Spring pitched for the Philadelphia Phillies, Boston Red Sox, Washington Senators, Los Angeles Angels, Chicago Cubs, St. Louis Cardinals, and Cleveland Indians from 1955 to 1965. This was the end of his MLB career. He went to Gonzaga University and also Washington State University and played on the baseball teams. He had 19 consecutive outings without a strikeout, the longest streak since 1957. He's in the Inland Northwest Hall of Fame, inducted in 2005 with John Stockton of the NBA. Spring died of Parkinson's. Parkinson's disease. In the minors, he played for the Portland Beavers, San Diego Padres, and Hawaii Islanders. Jack Spring. Mike Headland had no decisions in an ERA of 5.06. Six games, five and a third innings pitched, and four strikeouts. He batted once, did not have a hit, and struck out. He was born in 1946 in Dallas, Texas, and he's 72 years old in 2019. Headland was 25 and 24 for his career with an ERA of 3.56 and 211 strikeouts. Edlin pitched for the Cleveland Indians and Kansas City Royals from 1965 to 1972, so he was a rookie in 65. In Venezuela, he played for the Tiburones de la Guaira and Navegantes de Magallanes. 1971 with the Royals, he was 15-8 and with the fourth-best ERA in the American League, 2.71. After the season, he went on a Vietnam well, War tour of hospitals, goodwill tour for the troops and military bases with other MLB players. The Miners at Hedlund played for the Iowa Oaks, Omaha Royals, and Portland Beavers, and he's of Swedish descent. Mike Hedlund. 
And finally, Stan Williams had no decisions in an ERA of 6.23. Three games, four and a third innings pitched, and a, and a strikeout. He did not bat. Williams was born in 1936 in Enfield, New Hampshire, and he's 82 years old in 2019. For his career, he was 109 and 94, with an ERA of 3.48 and 1,305 strikeouts. Williams played for the Los Angeles Dodgers, New York Yankees, Cleveland Indians, Boston, Cleveland Indians, Minnesota Twins, St. Louis Cardinals, and Boston Red Sox from 1958 to 1972. He was a coach for the Red Sox, White Sox, Yankees, Cincinnati Reds, Seattle, and Seattle Mariners from 1975 to 1999. He was a two-time All-Star in 1960 when they played two games. He won two World Series titles in 1959 with the Dodgers as a player and in 1990 with the Reds as a coach. They called him Big Daddy and the Big Hurt. He was six foot five and 230 pounds. Williams had a blistering fastball and wasn't afraid to pitch inside. He also was a scout for the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, Washington, and Washington Nationals. In the minors, Williams played for the Spokane Indians, Portland Beavers, and St. Paul Saints. Stan Williams. After the regular season, the 1965 World Series was played, and the National League champions, Los Angeles Dodgers, defeated the American League champions, Minnesota Twins, four games to three. The MVP was Sandy Kovacs of the Dodgers. He did not pitch in game one because it was the Jewish holy day of Yom Kippur. However, Kovacs had shutouts in games five and seven and pitched in, had pitched on two days rest between those two games. This was the fifth year of the Minnesota Twins. They started in 1961 after moving from Washington, the old Washington Senators. Hall of Famers in the 65 World Series for the Dodgers, Walt Alston, the manager, Don, and Don Drysdale and Sandy Koufax. And for the Twins, Harmon Killebrew. Game 6, Jim Mudcat Grant, former Cleveland Indian, for the Twins had a complete game victory 5-1. to one, And Grant won two games in the World Series. Now, the uh, MVP is for 1965 the American League, Zo- Zoilo Versales of the Twins. In the National League, Willie Mays of the San Francisco Giants. And the Cy Young Award winner just won was Sandy Koufax for the Dodgers. So that's the story of the 1965 Cleveland Indians. They had a strong year. It was wonderful having Rocky Calavito back. Don't knock the rock. God bless the guys who played for the Cleveland Indians in 1965 and everyone else associated with the team, including the fans, especially the the Second World War veterans, Korean War veterans, and Vietnam War veterans, captains of the Cuyahoga, lovers of Lake Erie, Terminal Tower Power, fans of the Free Stamp Statue and the Fountain of Eternal Life, Euclid Avenue Electricity, Severance Hall Stalwarts, Cleveland Museum of Art Enthusiasts, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum Rebels, Christmas Story House Happy People, Museum of Contemporary Art Maniacs, Cleveland Botanical Garden Goers, Old Arcade Admirers, Playhouse Square Sears, Settlers Landing Park Purists, Western Reserve Historical Society Wonders, First Energy Stadium Friends, Progressive Field Pals, Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse Renegades. Cuyahoga Valley National Park Pioneers, Great Lakes Science Center supporters, and Holden Arboretum enjoyers. Tribe, Browns, Cavs, Monsters, Gladiators, and Fusion Rule. And also, Spiders, Bulldogs, Rosenblums, Barons, Rams, Crusaders, Force Crunch, Rockers, and Lumberjacks Rule. Cleveland, City of Champions. Cleveland is the best location in the nation on the north coast of America. New York is the Big Apple. Cleveland is a plum. It's been 71 years since 1948. This is our year. Go Tribe. Thank you so much for watching. Really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care. And I'll see you next time.